Good evening, distinguished colleagues. Today we have the fifth webinar. The topic is Making Sense of News, an Introduction to News Literacy. As usual, I would like to say that this webinar is being implemented within the framework of the Media Literacy for Librarians project. The project is implemented with a grant from the American Connors Program of the U.S. Department of State's Bureau of Cultural and Educational Programs. Our partner is the American Library Association, whose members are webinar speakers. Each webinar is attended uh, by the Director of International Affairs for the American Library Association, Mr. Michael Dowling. He's, he will join us later today. You probably already know, Michael. As for today's webinar, its topic is uh, related to news literacy. Our speaker of today's webinar is Michael Spikes. Welcome, Michael. I would like to say a few words about our speaker. Michael Spikes is a lecturer and director of uh, Teach for Chicago Journalism in the Middle School of Journalism, Media Integrated Marketing Communications at Northwestern University. He also is a PhD candidate in the learning sciences in Northwestern University School of Education and Social Policy. His research focus concerns uh, connecting cognitive, social, and learning environmental design theories to news media literacy, education, and interventions. Before uh, uh, before coming to Northwestern, Michael Spikes worked for the Center for News Literacy at Stony Brook University, where he developed curriculum and training in news literacy as a director of its digital resource center and Illinois News Literacy and Civic Learning Project. Michael has also held positions as a media studies and production teacher in both public and public charter schools in Washington, D.C. As a member of the museum's educational advisory team and as a media producer and editor for numerous organizations, including NPR, the PBS NewsHour, and the Kellogg School of Management. That is some information about the speaker of today's webinar. Michael, thank you very much for taking the time to participate in our project and speak on the webinar. Participants are specialists of the national libraries and public libraries of all the regions of our republic, as well as specialists of libraries of schools, colleges, and higher educational institutions. Distinguished colleagues, please note that webinar is translated into Kazakh and Russian languages. Professional translators Asim Baidildinova and Anna Kabardina are working with us. I hope you have all selected the desired translation language. Please check one more time. To select the translation language, click on the globe symbol at the bottom right of the computer screen and select the translation language you need. If you are using a mobile phone, click on the three dots with the inscription. Additionally, in the lower right corner of the display, then click on translation or interpretation in the window that opens, and then select Kazakh or Russian. 
then press down button. This way you can hear the translation of the webinar. If you have any questions, you can contact my coordinators of the webinar, Jana Sirk, Jana Sakpanova and Maya Sulimenova. You can see their phone numbers. 7705-761-2021 and Maya Suleiman was 7776-430-5353. You can write your questions in the chat box to the speaker and the speaker will answer after finishing his presentation. We will save the recording of this webinar and publish it on the YouTube channel. Uh, after this webinar is published, uh, we will send you the link. And now I would like to give the floor to our speaker, Mr. Michael Spikes. Michael, the floor is yours. So good evening, everyone, and thank you for joining us. As you heard a little bit, uh, I'm going to be talking to you today about a what I like to call a sub discipline of media literacy known as news media literacy. And I use this phrase in particular to harken back to media literacy as what we sometimes call the big tent of all of our various literacies that um, that encompass what we sort of talk about as a 21st century skill. You may have heard of other uh, types of these literacies, such as civic literacy as i heard one of my previous speakers um talk to you about and even ones like information literacy that i know many of you are very familiar with but in particular i'm going to be looking at news literacy and what that uh concerns is how we find reliable information from news sources what i'm going to be presenting to you today is a lesson that comes out of a undergraduate class that comes from my previous employer, the Center for News Literacy at Stony Brook University. We taught this particular class to all of our journalism um, students, and it was also a uh, class that we used to satisfy our graduation requirements. So we've had over, I want to say somewhere around 12,000 students that have taken this course. Um, and what you're going to be learning today is a little bit about how we make distinctions between news and other types of information. But first, as I share my slides here, there we go. Um, I'll share with you a little bit about my background so that you'll have some context around some of the things that I'll be talking about today. So, um, as you heard right now, I am a lecturer in the Medill School of Journalism. Along with that, I'm also a PhD candidate in the Learning Sciences in Northwestern School of Education and Social Policy. In particular, I took this uh, particular step to study news literacy education, which is something, as you heard, I've been involved with now for over 10, 10 years, probably more like 12 now, actually. So in addition to that, I've been involved with media education for somewhere around almost 20 years now. Uh, I'm going to tell you a little bit about my background and the research that I'm engaged in now. So as I as was mentioned, I've had a long career in media education, which actually started here in an elementary school library or a primary school library. Uh, in the state, the U.S. state of Ohio. Uh, I started in this job as the school's media specialist. And while it was the media part of the job that got me to apply for it, I essentially was the school's librarian. But it was in that role that I had the first occasion to work with students, in this case from grades one through six, and also run their computer lab. Um, I also helped lots of teachers with those needs. But also with that, I worked with students to use media to learn. 
Then it was after this time um, that I got involved with a radio production program and attended a conference outside of Washington, D.C. that had its focus on radio production. And from that, I met a woman who asked me to come out to D.C. to do some teaching in radio production uh, for young people. And in that, that made me that led me to that transition to the Washington, D.C. area where I started working with young people to produce um, radio. That also then branched out into some work with the public schools in which I was working with students around making media, both with video and with audio. Now, also during my work in D.C., as you heard, I was also part of the educational advisory team at the then known museum. This museum sadly has closed um, as of now, but they still make a number of resources available through their museum education program online. In this new in this museum, as it was known as a museum of news, we focused on uh, exhibits on producing news and also the consumption of news. And it was here that I learned about the program at the Center for News Literacy at Stony Brook. And at this time, this was around 20, 2010, where I went through a pretty intensive um, training on their course in news literacy and then later became part of their staff. Now, the course in news literacy spans a number of different concepts. Some of the things, and you'll hear some of them today, we taught lessons on understanding the impacts in particular of these two people that are on the background of this slide. These two people being Johannes Gutenberg and Mark Zuckerberg. We refer to them sometimes as the two birds. We frame them as actors who developed technological innovations that changed the world and the ways that people communicated. Gutenberg in particular with his printing press and Zuckerberg with the advent of Facebook that although I'll mention it was not the first social network, but was one of the first that um, really had wide scale around the world. Another lesson that we talk about from this, and you'll hear a little bit more later, is how what are the characteristics and goals of different genres of media? Some of those genres are on the screen now. They include journalism, propaganda, entertainment, and so on. We use this as a lesson to help our students focus on what makes journalism distinct and different from other genres, especially in an era where many of these genres blur together. We also discuss um, in our course, I won't be going over this today, but also as part of our course, we discuss what to look for in journalistic opinion. What does an opinion mean? What does journalistic opinion mean? And how does it differ from general opinions and just mere assertions? Another lesson focuses on how do we give clear definitions of what bias is, what media bias is, and what mechanisms are involved in driving audiences' predispositions and their own biases. And all of these come together in a process which we call the deconstruction of news. And in this case, students analyze news and other pieces of information in real time in order to determine their credibility. We use this series of questions that we can use to prompt students to become more mindful about their own media consumption. Now, along with this class that Stony Brook was teaching, we also had the goal of spreading the lessons that were part of news literacy to other educators, such as some of the work that I've been doing with the American Library Association and talking with you today. And when I joined the staff, I helped to head up a project for the center to develop its own digital resource center to make more of the materials that they would use to teach their course in their, um, on their campus to more people around the globe. And then later, I headed up a project in which I traveled around the state of Illinois as part of a civics education initiative to bring training in this area of news literacy to more educators. 
But in particular, it was after the election of 2016 that uh, here in the United States that more people became aware of the issues involved with this large proliferation of mis and disinformation on social media. So this brings me to today, where I took a step in trying to address the gap in understanding how do people take in information and what kind of interventions can we use to help people with becoming more mindful consumers of media. And that brought me to the learning sciences, which in particular is a field that looks at education through three distinct pillars, those being cognition, how do we think, how do we learn, what are the social and cultural contexts around learning? So how do we take into account people's backgrounds and if they're learning on their own or are they learning as part of a group? And how do we bring these understandings and ideas together through designing more um, effective learning environments? So how do we understand what learning environments are, such as the one that we're in right now? I'm bringing to you content through a webinar. What might be different um, about that webinar as compared to, say, me teaching you in a classroom. So we think about how we design those learning environments to make them as effective as possible. So my research now focuses on the actual instances of news literacy and media literacy in classrooms and other environments like libraries, where I've been involved in training librarians in news literacy skills and development of lots of different projects. Um, um, and along with that, continuing to work with the American Library Association in the development of a practitioner's guide for learning and teaching media literacy to, um, to their audiences. These efforts have also come full circle where another initiative that I've been involved with most recently has now, um, where we now have put into place a policy change in, in, um, in Illinois, where now all students in high school are now required to get a unit of media literacy education. Again, media literacy, as you heard me mention earlier, sort of like this big tent of all these skills that we use to become more mindful consumers of media. And as part of that, I've been doing a number of uh, talks publicly to both teachers and other constituents and also media interviews to talk and build awareness around media literacy in this state. So a colleague of mine and I, also in conjunction with this new requirement, built up uh, a number of resources to help um, teachers bring media literacy concepts into their classrooms, and that culminated into what, it, what we call our framework for media literacy education. And as part of this framework, we try to help teachers find ways to integrate media literacy into their already existing um, curricula. So they're not trying to do something brand new. So what I do with this framework in particular is try to use it as a means for kind of opening the door to teachers and other kinds of educators. I would also count all of you as librarians, as educators of uh, community based educators to also think about how they can integrate media literacy concepts as part of their regular practices. So we take this very broad sort of look at media literacy to help people do that sort of integration. What I'm going to do first here is I'm going to introduce you to a definition of media literacy that my colleague and I have used as part of our framework to start the conversation. So we'll start from the broader sort of uh, idea of media literacy, and then we'll target more so on news literacy. For us, we define media literacy as so. It is the ability to access, analyze, evaluate, create, and communicate using a variety of forms, including but not limited to print, visual, audio, interactive, and digital text. This definition in particular is taken from, well, is adapted from that of the National Association of Media Literacy Education. And it encompasses, as you see, a lot of different concepts or a lot of different, I should say, skills. Those are accessing information. So how do people know how to find uh, information, 
How do they know what information they have access to? How do they analyze and evaluate it? So how do they determine if that information is appropriate for the purposes that they have? And also creating and communicating. How do we use tools like the cameras on our phones, the, um, the platforms like social media that allow us to post, say, pictures, video, text? How do we use those platforms to communicate ideas? Again, what we try to also focus on, or, on is what are the intentions and what are the goals that we have for the messages that we want to send on these platforms and what might be the goals of the creators of those messages when we become the consumers of those messages? How can we become more mindful about our own consumption of messages? Some of the things we emphasize as part of media literacy just like I was mentioning, is that media literacy is a collection of both knowledge about media and skills informed by that knowledge. So some of the things we may need to know about, and you'll hear me talk about this today in the news literacy context, how is news put together? What are the skills that journalists draw upon to do their job? How is it that news is different from other genres of media these is what we would these answering these questions is what we would call knowledge about media itself and then what are the skills that can be informed by that knowledge so in particular if we know that journalists in particular need to verify information or claims that they make in stories with evidence then how can we as the consumers of media or consumers of news use those same kinds of skills to determine if the news that we're seeing is credible and reliable? Next, what we say is that media literacy is an ongoing practice that learners can exercise in a variety of ways. And by this, what we mean is that media literacy is something that we should continually look to learn more about over time. Media literacy, and even my area of news literacy, encompasses a number of different skills and pieces of knowledge. Even when you, when you leave this webinar or even our whole series of webinars, there will still be many other things that one can learn in this area and continue to build their skills in it. So we encourage people to continue thinking about media literacy skills as something that's ongoing. And we say that overall, when enacted, media literacy should give control to the consumer of media or the user of it to choose what media they use, how and when to use it, and how to address its impact. In particular, we focus on here how media literacy allows consumers to make the choice of what media they use to help inform themselves on issues that are important to them, how do they determine the goals that they have when they come towards media, and also what are the responsibilities that go with creating media and distributing it widely. So what are the responsibilities that we have because we are not only today media just consumers, but we're also media creators. And what are the responsibilities that go with that? So this, we would say, help uh, media consumers and creators to have more control over those processes. Okay, so that was our broad sort of look at media literacy. And now I'm going to target this down to news literacy. And I'm gonna give you a definition for it as we go along here today. So what I like to do is, again, I like to emphasize at the beginning of my sort of presentations on news literacy, I hearken back to introducing um, this topic of news literacy through these two people on this slide. Again, Johannes Gutenberg on the left and Mark Zuckerberg on the right. Yeah, we use both of these people as I had said actors before, but really we can think of them as inventors whose inventions have actually brought in revolutions in the ways that we communicate. Uh, again, Gutenberg's printing press uh, made movable type and the 
distribution of printed text much more widely available to more people. And that ushered in an era where more and more people needed to become literate or have the ability to read. And that brought into cases lots of changes to society. And then Mark Zuckerberg's Facebook, which again was not one of was not the first social network, online social network, but was the first that really gained scale around the world and use by lots of people. And again, ushered in another revolution in the ways that we communicated. So what we like to start with in talking to our students about news literacy is the first thing we'd like to start off with is what are the challenges that are in front of today's media consumer? We like to use these as a um, as a launching point for people to become more mindful about how they consume media and then how they use it. So the first challenge that we highlight, this is one of four, the first challenge that we highlight is that of speed versus accuracy. We mentioned to students in the class that we all have this need to share and receive information. If you hear a new piece of information or even a piece of gossip, what is the first thing that we usually want to do? We want to share it with someone. But that need to share something quickly can sometimes get in the way of making sure that it's accurate. Um, one of the lines that I think came out of the talks from one of the previous speakers was that information is cheap and fast, but knowledge is slow and deliberate. So in these cases, we have to keep in mind that the information that we may be able to get really, really quickly may be able to get our attention in the immediate moment, but it may be more important for us to wait to make choices decisions or how to take actions based on that information by making sure that we know that that information is credible and it takes time for us to get to that. We also live, we also have this added challenge of living in a media sort of space in which it, more and more information comes at us quick, uh, more and more faster. And in this age of social media, Lots of content is driven by individual users who don't always think about what, what time it takes to actually verify and check information. This is through what we call somewhat of a frictionless sharing of media, meaning that there aren't very many uh, hurdles to getting information out. There aren't hurdles that ask like, how do you know this is true? Or how do you know um, this information is accurate before you share it very widely? Now, this um, lack of friction allows people to enjoy benefits of sharing lots of kinds of messages online. But what that also does is it makes it more, um, uh, more prevalent for us as the consumers of that information to be able to make those decisions on what is credible and what is not, instead of letting the platforms or the people who are sending those messages do that. This then leads to our second challenge, which is that there's just too much information. We are awash in information online, which causes a situation known as information overload. And we know that in a space in which information is abundant, it becomes more important for that information to get our attention. And it becomes difficult for the consumer of that information to actually focus on one thing for too long, because the minute that they get one piece, here comes something else that's trying to get their attention. Uh, a quote that I think that uh, summarizes this well comes from a psychologist, Herbert Simon, who coined the phrase, the attention economy. I think you may have heard one of the previous speakers speak of this, where attention itself is a commodity that we use. And that quote is, a wealth of information creates a poverty of attention. So with having so much information around us, it again, it highlights that it can be really, really difficult for us to focus our attention on any one piece of information. So with this, it becomes all the more difficult to discern what information actually matters and needs more of our attention when we're swimming around in so much of it. And because of this, 
Uh, psychologists have also looked at these um, sort of like effects of being awash in all of this information. And what they find is that instead of people becoming more discerning of that information, they actually become less so and actually begin to sort of shut down the um, sort of thinking process that allowed them to really think about and discern how good the information is that's coming out there. This is also highlighted in the third challenge that we bring up in the course, and that is that media is now disintermediated. And what this means is that the middle person that actually goes from the media creator to the consumer of that uh, information is now gone. So you can think of this middle man or middle person as like a book publisher. Let's say that a person wants to write a book on a particular topic and get that out to a wide audience of people. In order to do so, they need to go to a publisher who can help them edit their text and put that text into a book form and then also distribute it. Now online, that middle person or that publisher now is a platform. That platform allows the creator of that media to almost instantly share that information to a consumer. So this is what we mean by this disintermediation. A more specific definition of media disintermediation disinter is that of a system of media creation and sharing that's largely characterized by the direct content, a contact between creators and consumers of media. Now, human intermediated, intermediaries in particular is what we focus on here. These people are largely absent from making decisions on the quality or relevance of information. Now, we might think, well, there are computers now that try to take the place of these middle people, these human middle people who try to make decisions of what media might be relevant for us as the consumers or can actually target that information to particular consumers. And that is true. But we also have to take into account what are the goals of these platforms. The goals of the platforms, and those being like social media uh, platforms such as Facebook, Instagram, and so on, their goal is to increase what they call engagement. And what that really translates to is how do we keep people on these platforms for longer periods of time? So there is less discernment of information on the basis of how credible it may be or how relevant it may be for the audience member, instead of how do we make sure that we capture their attention for a longer period of time. So because of this, it becomes, again, more, more onus is on the consumer of that information to make that choice for themselves. Along with this disintermediation of media, we also highlight a second part of this challenge, which we call a blurring of the lines. And by this, what we mean is that we sometimes categorize media into genres. So we know that they are, something is either trying to entertain me or something is trying to inform me or something is trying to persuade me. In these cases, these distinct genres now get very much blurred together online, where we see things like influencers who we may have first interacted with because we thought they were entertaining, starting to change their goals of their media from just being entertaining to actually trying to persuade. And that may be driven by, say, uh, a company that helps to sponsor their particular content or so on. So this blurring of the lines makes it even more difficult for us as consumers to make decisions about what information is credible and what is not. To highlight this particular blurring of the lines, lots of times I use this example from Facebook. Here are two posts from Facebook. And what I usually do in my introductions to this topic, I ask my audience, can you identify what are some differences between these two posts? So what I'll do with the group here, I won't, uh, we're, we're a pretty big group. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to pause here for about 30 seconds. I'm going to give you a little bit of time to look at both of these posts and try to determine what are some of the differences for yourselves. 
Let's take 30 seconds to do so, and then I'll highlight some of them. All right, so in looking at both of the posts that are on this slide, you'll see that the post on the left comes from the outlet NPR, which here in the United States is the national public radio known as a news outlet. The, the post on the left highlights the breeding of a, a story on the breeding of a habanero pepper that has all the flavor of the pepper, but doesn't have the heat of the pepper. And then on the right, we see a video story that looks like it might come from a news outlet. And in particular, you may have noticed that the screens behind the presenters in that video say Good Day Orlando, which actually is a morning uh, news program in the state of Florida. But however, you might look a little bit closer at that post and you see things like sponsored towards the top in identifying who this comes from. And you may have also identified that some of the text on the screen makes reference to uh, getting $30 off your first order. Here is a coupon code. And then in the lower right hand corner, some people will identify that there is a shop now button. So this uh, example highlights, we see something that looks like news, and for the people who live in this area, they might have identified the people there as um, maybe journalists or anchors, people who usually bring them the news. But in reality, this uh, piece, its goal is actually to sell something. So this is actually an advertisement. So this is what we use to highlight this sort of blurring of the lines. And the content online very much looks the same. So while, yes, looking at it in this context, we see that sponsored link up there that tries to tell us that this is an ad, while scrolling through, it can be difficult for us to see those markings while we're just scrolling through social media. We also highlight um, this issue as being, as creating a, what we call a crisis of authenticity. And that is, knowing whether or not the information that we see online is really authentic to the person who is posting it. So this is a, uh, a picture that I sometimes like to use with my audiences where on, on online, we may want to present the best version of ourselves. So you see that the Facebook version of you is this very interesting person. But then on the right side, we see that the realistic version of you might not be that interesting. So in these cases, we highlight a particular concept that comes out of sort of um, media scholarship, and that is that media are constructions. And that is that what that means is that we make choices in media about what we will keep in it and what we will leave out of it when we create messages. We do that sometimes to make sure that they're as clear as possible so people can understand what our intentions are. But in some cases, we might use them to create a persona, such as what we see in this picture. There's another cartoon that I sometimes use, too, to highlight this concept with students. And this is a very old cartoon, probably from some 30 years ago, that was um, posted in The New Yorker, the magazine The New Yorker, when the internet was in its infancy. And the, uh, and the caption on this says, on the internet, nobody knows you're a dog. And that is that we're all using the same text. At that time, we were all using text online to talk to one another. And people could create these sort of personas online and represent themselves to be something that they may be or might not be. 
We also highlight this through something called deep fakes. Um, these days, you may have heard of these and these being completely synthesized videos where now it can be difficult for us to make determinations on whether or not what we are seeing is believing, as you might have heard sometimes. Um, so we have these things and lots of others that also uh, fit into this category of this crisis of authenticity. So again, it comes back to the theme that I keep mentioning, and that is the onus of determining credibility of information is really on us as the consumers. All right, and our last challenge is best summed up um, in this clip. I'll answer the question. You want answers? I think I'm entitled. You want answers? I want the truth. You can't handle the truth. So while the clip may or may not have been as familiar, that line of you can't handle the truth is very familiar to many. And that we highlight here as saying it can be difficult for us to handle the truth. And it can be difficult for us for this last challenge to overcome our own ideas about the world or our own biases about the world. And one of the things that we try to highlight for students is we have to consume information from a lot of different sources in order to develop understandings and challenge our own biases. These can be really, really important for us to do. We highlight these in other lessons. I'm not gonna go over this today, but we highlight this in lessons that talk about phenomena such as cognitive dissonance, which is actually the, um, the problems in our minds that can come up when we try to hold ideas uh, from different perspectives at the same time. So it can cause us trouble to do so. We also talk to our students about confirmation bias. And what this refers to is we like information that confirms our already preconceived beliefs. And again, because of this, it can be difficult for us to take in information that counters those beliefs. And the last one, even though I need to be careful about um, using this one because the science is still uh, somewhat uh, debate it on this, and this is this idea of a backfire effect. And what this refers to is if we're having a conversation with someone who differs in their beliefs than we do, we sometimes believe that in order to co um, convince them to come over to our side, we just need to give them more information or more facts. But with that, the more facts that we'll give to that person, the more that that person will just double down and their own beliefs. Um, so there can be somewhat of a backfire effect where we try to give them more of that information. So these are some of those effects that can get in the way of us determining and finding reliable, credible information. So with these challenges, what can we do? So we have a couple of tools out there that may help us. In particular, some are outlets that try to tell us or fact-checking outlets that try to tell us if a piece of information is true or not. So we have these. We also have checklists that will tell us, here, are, go through these questions when you encounter a piece of information. We also have technologies that try to determine or tell us if something is reliable or not. And while all of these things can be helpful, what I'd like to emphasize is that they are only tools that may work in particular situations. And the challenge becomes what happens when, say, the checklist has a question that's not applicable to the piece of information that you've come to, or the piece of technology hasn't doesn't work with the particular outlet that you're looking at or reading. So again, what I like to emphasize is that no one tool can be the sort of magic wand that helps everyone discern every piece of information. So because of that, what I like to emphasize is something known as mindful media consumption. And that is shifting our mindsets to make sure that we stay active consumers of media so that the questions that might have been in that checklist are almost um, automatic 
for us. And those questions could include things like, how do we know this? Where did this come from? Why did this person share this with me? Or so on. And this um, is also talked about in research as being one of the more effective means for actually countering the effects of exposure to misinformation online. So by shifting that attention and making sure that we can find reliable information can help us in determining how reliable that information is. And the ways that we develop these sort of skills can come through interventions like those that I'm presenting to you today. Um, those come from media literacy education. They can also come from news literacy education. And what these interventions do is they are a collection of concepts for driving more mindful consumption behaviors. But news literacy in particular, we use journalism as a platform for both developing the skills needed and practicing those skills. Because both, we can ask ourselves, what are some of the skills that journalists use to do their work? How can we adopt those skills? And then can we turn around and use those skills to check the work of journalists? So this is why we like to use this, what we like to emphasize as part of news literacy. So what is news literacy? Here is a particular definition that comes out of the Center for News Literacy, and that is, it is the ability to use critical thinking skills to judge the reliability and credibility of news reports, no matter where they come from. So what are some of the skills that we can use to judge credibility of news? And again, thinking about that previous uh, challenge that I talked about, that blurring of the lines online, there are lots of things that may call themselves news, but may or may not be so. How do we make sure that we have the skills to be able to determine that? One of the other ways that we'd like to expand this definition is by saying, not only are we thinking about reliability and credibility of news, but we're also thinking about the credibility of information that is actionable. So this is another term that we may use, because you may have heard from some that the um, there is a lack of trust in journalists and lack of trust in news itself. So sometimes you'll encounter people who say, I don't really read the news because I think it's all biased. So we try to take this definition and change it a bit to not only think about news as this particular genre of media, but as giving us information that allows us to take actions. And actionable information should allow us as its audience to make decisions, take actions, or know whether or not to share it responsibly with others. So this helps to broaden the discussion about uh, the types of information that we might be using and that we might have to be more discerning about. Um, so in particular, it might have to do with picking a candidate to vote for or a platform to um, adopt or to think more broadly about issues in our communities. What information do we use to make those kind of decisions? And we emphasize, as you heard me say, now it is up to us as a consumers to make decisions about what information is reliable and what is not. Because now we're not only consumers of media, we're also publishers of media. And we need to understand the responsibilities that go along with that. So now that we've set up this um, sort of beginning here, now we get into our next lesson in news literacy, which is about making distinctions between journalism and other genres of media. In this lesson, what we try to do is categorize media using a specific set of characteristics. By going through these characteristics, we describe the three traits that define journalism as they're explained in the news literacy course. And what we also do is we apply these correct characteristics to different pieces of media. Uh, for our time, we're gonna focus specifically on news or journalism and what distinguish it, distinguishes it from other genres. 
Okay, as you heard me uh, talk a little bit about earlier, as part of the news literacy course, one of the lessons that we use here, it's all about knowing your, what we refer to as information neighborhoods. We can also think of these as the genres of media that we encounter. What we highlight for students in this particular lesson is six particular genres, those being journalism, propaganda, raw information, entertainment, advertising, and publicity. And one of the things we try to do in this particular genre, uh, in this particular lesson, is make distinctions between each of these. To do so, what we use is something known as a taxonomy of information neighborhoods. Now on the screen, you'll see that there's a short link here that will allow you to copy a, a, to get a copy of this taxonomy for your own uses. In this taxonomy, what we do is we highlight in each of these six genres of media, what are the goals of each of these genres? What are the methods or how do they create, how are this messages or media created in each of these genres? Who are the practitioners who create media in these genres? And what are the intended outcomes? Again, we highlight this through these six genres of media. And what we'll focus on today are these two particular characteristics. So in particular, what are the goals of each of these pieces of media? So in particular, you'll see here we have for journalism, it's to inform. Entertainment is to amuse. Advertising is to sell. Publicity is to promote. Propaganda to build mass support raw information to bypass. Raw information in particular is a newer genre of media that sort of bypasses all of the traditional sort of outlets, filters. Sometimes we refer to these people as gatekeepers of information. And you can think of this as a video from a cell phone that's posted on a social media platform. It goes directly from the consumer, I mean, from the uh, creator of that message to the consumer without much uh, thought about what the intentions are and so on. It's just posted. That's how we sort of uh, determine raw information. We also think about what are the outcomes of media in each of these genres. As you'll see here, journalism, as we have, has to empower citizens by educating them in entertainment, a distraction, or a changed view of daily life, advertising, increased sales of products. Publicity, higher fees for talent or for, say, a brand. Propaganda and to help to push an ideological idea. Raw information, outlets for self-expression, entertainment, promotion, and so on. But it can be difficult for us to make determinations on um, if a piece of media that we're seeing is actually distinguishing one of these genres. So I'm going to show you next um, a example piece that highlights this sort of blurring of the lines between all of these genres of media. As you watch, what you should take account of or think about is which one or multiple genres do you think that this fits into? Okay, this is about a one minute video. We'll take a look at it now. Getting that perfect photo is now more important than ever. Selfie sticks have helped get a better shot, but at the inconvenience of carrying it. At Ms. Moose, we understand the importance of looking great without giving up comfort. The selfie stick is a great solution to a problem, but in turn, it has created a new problem. This was the opportunity for Ms. Moose to create an even greater solution. Introducing the Selfie Shoes. No matter where you go, you'll always be camera ready. Just insert your phone into the port, raise it to the perfect angle, and click the internal button with the tap of your toe to take the photo. To get the best range of angles, we have also added a docking port on each shoe. So you can get a photo from either your right or your left shoe. 
great thing about the selfie shoes is you no longer need to use your arm. So now both hands are free to be in the photo. We're all super pumped about the selfie shoes. With wearable devices on the horizon, the possibilities are endless. We're working on a charging functionality as well as making the selfie shoes water resistant. So really, we're just getting started. Sign up to be one of the first to get a pair at mismoves.com slash selfie shoes. So this is somewhat of a, a funny example that I like to use, but it can sort of help us, you know, think a little bit more about the genres that we think that media might be a part of. Now, usually in my workshops, this is when I'll have people talk to one another to try to determine which one of these genres or multiple genres they think this video fits into. And lots of people, when I go back around and I'll ask them which one of the categories or the genres do they think this fits into, many will start with entertainment. And I'll ask, well, why do you think entertainment? And they'll say, well, it was funny. Because we would not, while we could probably think of um, people who might want this selfie shoe, they might say, well, while I could have that, I think I couldn't kick my leg up that far. So they laugh at it. So while, yes, it does sort of fit into that category because it is amusing or it's funny, this particular video. And then I'll ask, do you think it might fit into other categories? Some might say advertising because it seems like it's trying to advertise these shoes. Um, uh, while that it has a product there. And they usually say those are the two genres it seems to fit in. In reality, this is a uh, actually this is a piece of publicity that was posted by the company Ms. Moves, which is actually a real company online that sells shoes and was used to promote its brand on um, on a sort of joking day we have here in the United States known as April Fool's Day or might be further in more places. So in this again, this highlights how media can blur the lines between all of these categories. Again, it's kind of a funny example, but it allows us to see how a piece of media, this particular video, sort of branches the, uh, blurs the lines between the categories or genres of entertainment, advertising, and publicity. I'll then highlight other examples, such as this page. This is the news page from NBA.com. And again, I'll have my uh, audience members usually talk to another person and say, well, what genre of media do you think this fits into? And then as they think and talk about it, they might say, well, it says it's news, but they also know that it comes directly from the National Basketball League. And in this case, we may or may not call it all journalism, but how do we make the determinations between that? We have something that calls itself news, but comes from an outlet that might not be um, as independent as, say, a journalism outlet, right? Because this comes directly from, again, the National Basketball Association. So this, again, highlights that blurring of the lines between all of these genres. So now from here, I uh, get into what are our definitions of news. And the particular definition of news that we use in news literacy is that news is information of some public interest that's shared and subject to a journalistic process of verification for which an independent individual or organization is directly accountable. And as you see, this is usually the point where I'll say to my students, there is a reason why the three words, verification, independent, and accountable, I highlight it and underline. So these are the three things that we emphasize to students that we should look for in something that calls itself news. Or again, we might think of news as information that I should be able to take some action with. So what do each of these characteristics look like? 
So verification. Verification is the process that establishes or confirms truth or accuracy of a claim. Verification, what we look for is if a claim is made, we look to how is this claim verified with evidence. So how might consumers look for this? So first, as an example, I'll take a story from um, the National Public Radio that talks about um, a study that mentions is that the Omicron variant of COVID-19 poses about half the risk of long COVID as the Delta variant. So this is the claim that is made in the story. We usually find that claim in what is known as the lead of the story or the first sentence of the story. So we see this claim or this, or this, yeah, the claim that's made in the story in its lead saying the Omicron variant is much less likely than Delta to cause long COVID. According to the first large scale study published about the long-term risks posed by Omicron. So that is the claim. We see the claim and our next question should be, how do they know that? So how do they verify this claim? What is the evidence? We go further down in the story and we see the findings published Thursday in the Lancet, and there's also a link here that could take us to that study, came from researchers at King's College London who have been tracking thousands of people who test positive for the coronavirus to determine the risk of long COVID from different variants. So this tells us <laughs> where this information comes from and how they knew it, knowing that it comes from a study where is that study in the Lancet? So we have one piece of evidence here that helps to verify that claim. We go further down the story and we get some information on the methods that were used to get that information or to get that evidence. And those being the researchers compare 56,000 people, more than 56,000 people who caught Omicron from December 20th, 2021 through March 9th, 2022, with 41,000 over that, who had caught Delta between June 1st, 2021 and November 1st, November 27th, 2021, and kept track of their symptoms using a special app. So we have here yet another piece of evidence that helps to support or verify the claim made in the lead. So again, verification is all about asking what evidence is used to support the claims that are made in this story. A very important tool for journalists and even more so important for us as consumers to think about when we hear claims, how they are verified and how we can know that they're credible. Next, we go to independence. The definition of independence that we use is that independence is freedom from the control or influence of interested parties coupled with a system of checks and balances to avoid the influence of pre-existing beliefs. Now, lots of verification can help with this, but it also is important for us to think about the outlet of the information that we're getting something from or the source that we're getting it from. How independent is that source? Is that source bringing a predisposition or a particular point of view that might shape the message that we're getting. But journalists and for news, that source should be fairly independent from any type of influence or control from parties that might be interested in shaping either the outcome of that story or the way that it's framed. An example of this that I highlight in um, lots of uh, my talks on this, is the uh, uncovering of a mayor of a city who took on a pseudonym to actually write news stories about his own city. Now, we would say that the mayor of the city, as a source of information about that city, while he may be a very informed source because he needs to know much about you know, the ongoings of his city, we might say that that person was not very independent because they might be hesitant to tell stories that make the city look bad. 
So in this case, again, we highlight how independent is the source of the information that you're getting. Now, the news outlet that reported this story that said that the, you know, they did the investigation and they found that the mayor was using this false identity to create these stories, we would need to make sure that that was verified. But we would also say that this news outlet is fairly independent because they can challenge, say, the mayor of the city and find or do an investigation to see if they were doing, had any wrongdoing. That level of independence allows them to do that. Um, I'm going to skip these. Oh, well, I'll also mention that sometimes some of the ways that we can determine how independent an outlet is, is we can try to look for how they describe how what the methods are that they do their work. There are some outlets, however, that are not very transparent about those methods. And as sometimes I'll highlight in some of my um, uh, in some of my presentations, is that there are some outlets that are less independent that are not that may take on the they look like news but might actually be trying to push a particular agenda or point of view lastly we have accountability and that is we define this as being responsible for the information that's shared being accountable means that you will put your name to it and take that responsibility so how do we check for that we can check for accountability in news by seeing are there authors and actual names attached to those authors of the information being brought to us again as news. If there is not, or there say a, a pseudonym, we may have to question where that information comes from or how accountable the person is for that information. We also can look for corrections. Are there, if, if mistakes are made, and they are made in the uh, journalism sort of circles, are the creators of that media or the publishers, do they make it clear that they understood what mistake they made and what steps they took to correct that information? So when we put all of these three together, verification, independence, accountability, it helps us to determine how reliable or if we can call this thing news or journalism. The thing we want to take away here is that when encountering a piece of content, again, that calls itself news, and we want to make sure that that information is verified, that the outlet is independent, and that they are accountable for that information. One last example that I'll bring up um, that highlights the need for these sort of skills is a test that was done a few years ago with, um, I think this was done with middle school and high school students where they were asked, which one of these two pieces of media do you think would be most reliable for finding out information about climate change? One is a piece from the Atlantic that says why, that has the, um, headline of why solving climate change would be like mobilizing for war or this piece that is on the great transition and has this chart. These two pieces were shown to students and they were asked, which one of these two do you think would be the more reliable piece of information that you could use, say, if you were writing a report on climate change? We take a look at these and take a look closer at them. Which one did most students pick? It actually was B, because they would look at it and say, well, I see this chart here. I think there's a lot of good information here. But one of the things that they don't take into account is that this content is sponsored and is sponsored in part by Shell Oil. So we might say that independence from this outlet, while this piece of media looks very convincing and looks like it would give us the most information on climate change, I mean, just from what we can see here, we have to take into account that that outlet or that piece of media is not very independent because it is, it is sponsored by an oil company. So we might have to question some of the methods that are used here. So 
when thinking about how we use these information neighborhoods to help us make these sort of determinations of whether or not information is credible, if it calls itself news, includes the following takeaways. That information can be separated into neighborhoods based on key characteristics, and those characteristics help us to determine what are the genres of media of the things that we're seeing. That these characteristics can allude to the intended goal of the media message that's being communicated, that being if it's journalism to inform, if it's entertainment to amuse, and so on. And by able to determine that, that can help us determine how we should respond to it and think about it. And when thinking about news or journalism, it should be categorized with the acronym VINA. It should have verification, independence, and accountability. And one of the last things we highlight that I don't think I mentioned very much here today is that some forms of media will borrow characteristics of news, creating a blurring of lines between categories. So there are times where we'll see something that, again, looks like news, it sounds like news, but it actually may be just using those characteristics to amp up its own level or in um, its own sort of veneer of credibility, while in reality, it's a more sort of questionable sort of piece. So with that, um, I so that is the end for me um, in those tools, and I will be happy to take your questions. Thank you very much, Michael. Everything was very fine. Uh, they've written that translation was very good in the chat box. Uh, some of the participants had technical problems. Uh, but uh, most of the people, most of the participants uh, have said that Everything was good. As for the questions, uh, the first question, nowadays journalists are increasingly using social networks as a source for news. And uh, related to that, I have two questions. How do you feel about the fact that journalists turn to social networks for news? And the second question, in this case, what is the difference between the work of a professional journalist and the publication of an ordinary blogger? Good question. So to answer the first, I think in particular, well, journalists do turn to social media lots of times because of something I didn't get, I didn't talk about a lot when we looked at those information neighborhoods, but that if we take that genre of raw information, because people will post like thoughts, um, lots of information that maybe those particular journalists may not have been able to capture by going out into the field and finding that information. But it does make it all the more relevant for those journalists to make sure that they are being very transparent with us as the consumers of that information for telling us why they went to draw from, say, a source from social media. So while there's lots of information that can be posted there, we see like lots of videos that journalists might pull from as part of their stories. I think they should be more transparent with us about why they did so. They might say, we did not have access to this particular area, or this was a piece of video that we were able to check. For us as consumers, that transparency, um, again, we might want to take into account, does the journalist say things like, we have not been able to independently verify this video or independently verify what we see here. What we would hope the journalists would do is that they would reach out and, and find that information so that they could verify that information. But again, for us as consumers, we should listen out for that if that um, happens. In terms of the other question, um, now I'm trying to remember it. Um, ah, I forgot the second question. Could you give it to me one more time?
uh, what is the difference? The second question is, uh, in this case, uh, the case I've already described, what is the difference between the work of a professional journalist and the uh, publication of an ordinary blogger? Right, right. The journal is the difference between the journalist and the blogger. One of the main differences that I would highlight is that what are the editorial processes that a journalist would need to go through as opposed to a blogger? And what that refers to is what is the outlet? So say a journalist works for a news outlet, that journalist, yes, they are the person who goes out and, and finds the information, they put the story together, but that story has to go through a number of editors. So there should be a you know multiple people who are working behind that journalist that help to, I don't want to just say shape that story, but to improve that story. I know in my own work as a, and I have to say, I don't call myself a journalist. I call myself a media producer. I have been in that role where say a reporter brings me a story and then I will say to them, this is good. This is good. You need more on this. So those have, and we can also think of this as like peer review, right? We have other people that review that work to determine how credible it is. If there's more information that might be needed before it goes out to the audience. A blogger, on the other hand, may do a lot of the same work as a journalist in terms of maybe going out and talking to people and putting a story together. But in more cases than not, they do not go through those same editorial processes. So there may not be as many people behind them. Now, what that allows them to do is to get out, they may get out information faster, but it may be more prone to errors or they may not be as independent as we would like them to be, right? So in those cases, that would be a distinction I would make between a blogger and that, and that of the work of a journalist. Thank you very much for the answer. The next question. Today, the number of fake news is increasing every day, and it often happens that uh, people's emotions take over and they believe in fake news. Because in most cases, uh, fake news fit their personal beliefs and the facts and evidences are not always perceived if they somehow do not coincide with their vision of the world. You have told about this in the webinar. It turns out that only those who want to protect themselves from false information uh, can discern between false and true information. As librarians, we work with different people, what can we do in such a situation if people tend to believe into fake news? Because so you, it fits their, it fits their uh, beliefs. Right. So like you mentioned, as I talked about earlier, it's really difficult to um, uh, challenge one's own beliefs. The phrase that I'll use sometimes is when we come towards information, we bring all our baggage with us. We bring our previous experiences, how we've been raised, what we've learned, and what we've learned from people in our social circle, along with what we may have learned in more formal educational settings. So when we bring all that towards information, it shapes the frame that we you know, that we have of that information. And like you said, it can be really, really difficult for us to challenge those existing beliefs, especially if we hold those beliefs really, really close to who we are. Now, in response to that, what I would say is, if you remember um, earlier, I talked about this idea of a backfire effect. The other thing I talked about was this cognitive dissonance that I may or may not have explained very, very well. But again, we have to acknowledge, number one, that it's very, very difficult to take in information that counters existing beliefs. So instead of trying to counter those beliefs, what I think we should do 
is try to help people engage in a process of what you may have heard my other uh, colleagues talk about, engage in a process of inquiry about those beliefs or information. So I remember in another uh, presentation I gave, I had a gentleman come to me afterwards after I gave a talk on bias. And when I talk about bias, I first talk about balance and I talk about fairness. And I really emphasize the concept of fairness. Is what we're getting fair to the evidence that's out there? So I had a gentleman come up to me afterwards and say, I liked your presentation, but he didn't like my examples because they came from more sort of what we would call mainstream journalism. Um, and I asked him about, well, what are some of the outlets you engage with? And he told me some of them, and I would probably call them somewhat questionable. But then I asked, how do you know what they're bringing to you there, right? So just by starting that conversation, and showing some interest in maybe outlets that I may have called questionable, I think that can start to open the door for that person to begin to engage in these in their own sort of processes of inquiry. Those being, how do I know this? What evidence have I brought towards this? Can I verify this information? Bring them into those practices. Not and again, it can be very difficult for us not to want to um, uh, correct their incorrect beliefs. But I think by starting there, we can start them through uh, sort of picking up some of these same practices that I'm sure all of us use when we come towards information. That also being said, what I also will acknowledge is that you may or may not be very effective in doing so in just one conversation. It may take multiple conversations for that to really stick for that person. So also acknowledge that. But I think there can be a big win if we at least start to shift, again, that mindset towards those questions of where, where do we get this from? How do I know this? And so on. I think that can be an approach that we maybe can take. Thank you very much. The next question in Russian. Um, we sometimes see this problem that one publication publishes the news and then others simply reprinted by word by word. There were, therefore, if a person wants to receive additional information, most often turns to social networks because there will be no new information on other media. Everyone says the same thing. What do you say about those situations? We, we see that happen in Kazakhstan often. So yes, that does happen very frequently where one outlet will publish something and then other outlets will just pick it up and reprint it. The first thing that we would hope is that in those those outlets that just reprint that information that they would um, attribute or cite where they got that information from. And then what we would hope is that one of the lessons that we teach to our students is that it's important, especially if this is a big story, to follow it over time. So in the immediate, the only things we might know are like the what of what happened. So we may only know this, excuse me, this thing happened at this time, at this place. Once you start to hear those things get repeated, what I would tell uh, my students many times is, once you hear that repeated, turn it off and come back later. Because all you're going to get is just the same thing over and over again. And a lot of times, especially in the, I think in the TV or broadcast realm, they have to fill time. So what they fill the time with is speculation on why a certain thing happened. They won't have the, the information that says why it happened. They'll just try to fill in like details of things they may or may not have known. So I think it's important sometimes, especially in these like breaking news situations, once you start to hear information get repeated, step back, 
and then say, okay, well, I'm going to let these people do their jobs, find out more, and then I'll come back to the story later. And in some cases, what I would also emphasize is sometimes stories don't get followed up. And hopefully what we can do as consumers sometimes, if the outlet is accountable for that information, you remember me talking about that earlier, they will make people like the journalists, the authors, the publishers, they will be public people that we can hopefully talk back to and say, you know, what happened with X story? Could you follow up on this, right? There may have been things they left out. So I think as active um, uh, members of their audience, we can also play a role in making sure that they can follow up on those stories and do that work. Granted, we're one, you know, we may just be one person out of, you know, very many, but I'm sure that many of the journalists who, who are doing this work would be happy to hear from somebody that says, you know, I acknowledge that you did X, but hopefully yet you can do more. So what I would emphasize there is we have to sort of get out of this, uh, I think, uh, cycle of always needing information right at the moment it happened. I mean, granted, there are some pieces of information we need, such as if we're in danger or something like that. That's true. But I think for very complicated issues, it's important for us, I think, to follow those stories over time. And one other thing I would mention here, too, is that in the news that we consume, we might ask ourselves, what is our own goal for coming towards it? Is it just to be alerted about what happened or is it really to understand what is happening? And I think in order to get that understanding, we need contextual information that helps to tell us that. So by context, as I'm sure many of you are familiar with, we talk about context, we talk about not just what happened, but we talk about why has this happened? Has this happened in the past? What did we do when this happened in the past? Who were the people who were involved with this? How have those people been involved in the past? Those kind of things. I think that kind of news, I know for myself as a news consumer, the kind of news I look for gives me insights. It doesn't just alert me because I can get that from lots of places. We can get that from social media, right? We can go on social media and get lots of people reacting to something. True. But the thing that I think that is missing is that context. And I think what I would emphasize, and I try to emphasize this to my students too, I don't try to tell them where they should get their news from because I always get that question. But I would say to them, think about your own goals for learning about this particular topic. Look for news that meets those goals. Are you looking for insights or are you just looking to be alerted? I think we have to go more towards that sort of insightful um, sort of information. So I hope that's helpful. Thank you very much. So libraries and librarians uh, at their places, they can initiate local community and active citizens to um, discuss important, socially important, uh, significant issues and questions. In order to um, to promote like civic uh, literacy and activism among their clients, and also develop their media literacy skills on the one hand, and also promote uh, active participation of the of the citizens in solving some of the local issues. Is that right? I have one more question. Among my friends, uh, many, many of my friends do not believe into the, in the classical media. They read uh, the news and the Telegram channels they trust, and uh, they read the news on the accounts of the famous people uh, whom they consider to be authorities. The question is the following. 
Does this contribute to the decline of the importance of media literacy in the society? The second question, does this mean that over time, the news will not be associated with professional journalism? I think that's a that's a good question. I think what that what that um, relates to is something I talked about earlier was that sort of crisis of authenticity. It is that because we are so awash in so much information that the influence of the traditional what we sometimes call gatekeepers of information and journalists were included in that group, the influence of those people is declining because we have people who are very, um, what's the word I'm thinking of, are, are, are very uh, enthusiastic or very compelling. That's what I'm thinking of. Are compelling to either watch or listen to, but are not very um, knowledgeable or, or authoritative on the topics that we're interested in. So I I do worry sometimes that because what that's doing is it's really harming society. And we do see, we see examples of that. We see examples that of, um, I'm trying to recall a, uh, an author who wrote about the decline of um, not authority, but decline of expertise. We don't really think about the expertise of the sources of information that we get, more so what we're concerned with is how entertaining they might be. That's where we get into this world of influencers and so on. Um, with that being said, however, I do think that um, we do come back, I think as we get older, we start to come back to those people of authority or those people who have who are experts in particular areas um i think it's just harder to get to those people um the other thing that i'll acknowledge too is that i sometimes talk about is that i worry that we are moving towards a society in which there will be an elite who will have access to reliable credible information and that elite will be people who can usually pay for that Right. And I think in society, we've always had the sort of elite group of people and then everybody else will just get the information that they get on social media. And that information will be questionable in its own credibility. Um, that being said, I think it's more important. I think it makes it even more important for us to engage with people like yourselves who are really interested in these sort of issues who can continue to learn and build skills in these areas, and then hopefully go out and influence, you know, make impacts with their own small circles of influence. Those being, like you were saying, your own friends, the people who are around you. Because while I cannot say that, like, definitively this is the case, I, um, again, this is just anecdotal, but... You know, there are cases where if you bring in a person into a conversation that is an expert or is a person who knows how to discern, I think, information and how credible it is, I think it can help that whole circle. Because I would I would like us to think of ourselves as those more authoritative sources of information. So, again, you all as librarians, you are experts in these areas of making sense of information discerning credibility. And I would really, you know, um, bring that to all of your communities, again, by engaging them in practices of inquiry, not just saying like, I know everything, because we should be questioning of those people who come to us and tell us like, yes, I know, I know everything on, you know, on everything. Because one of the things I would say for myself is, as somebody who is now a who is a practitioner in this area and is now a scholar in this area and is pursuing, you know, a terminal degree, a, a Ph.D., I would say what that taught me was um, not that I'm just very, very smart, but that I know a lot about this very small area. But it made me very comfortable with admitting that there's lots of things I don't know and that I will need to continue to 
engage in reading and you know learning just as I'm learning from you all you know to continue engaging in that so with that being said I hope that uh you know all of us can sort of go out there and be our own advocates for this sort of work but also know that I, I think like what I'm trying to teach will never go as far as what an influencer can do online and I'm comfortable I I feel comfortable with that because I do think that it can be much more impactful but for me to talk to audiences who can then go out and do it themselves. Thank you very much. Uh, the second question, uh, you have already answered the second question because we had the, uh, the following question that uh, news, uh, does it mean that news will not be associated with the professional journalism? But you have already said, answered this question, I think, because professional journalism is always there. I think the questions are over. Thank you very much. I've already uh, written for myself. Uh, the information is fast. Information is fast and the knowledge is slow, you have said. That's very important for us, for librarians, because we have to have that in mind, keep that in mind, and we have to communicate this to our readers. And we need to develop our media literacy and help our readers develop their media literacy. I want to thank all of the participants. No questions. Our participants have written in the chat box uh, that they liked the presentation. Everything was clear and they say they got a lot of information. They are writing that they are very grateful to Michael and also to the interpreters, Anna and Asya. I would like to thank the interpreters as well. Next webinar will be on the 26th of April at 7 p.m. Astana time, in order to know uh, the news about the project, you need to follow our account in the Instagram. We will send you the link to the recording of this webinar on the YouTube channel. You can listen to it again. If you had any problems, any technical problems uh, with the webinar today was joining webinar today or those who are fasting and were not able to be until the end they can listen to this thank you very much michael i would like to thank all the participants for joining us goodbye michael goodbye everybody thank you very much we are very happy to be with you